this unit here. University. Thank you very much. He graduated from Lipscomb University and he is currently working on his PhD in humanities here at Faulkner. He is married to Georgia Harmon Butt and they have two daughters, Emma and Grace Ann, who are both biology majors at Freed Hardman University. And it says here in his free time he likes to read, play cards, and hunt. And Stan, we are very thankful that you're here with us tonight. We know when you signed up you didn't know you'd be preaching in Candyland, uh, but we're thankful. Uh, that you're here with us tonight. I won't take up any more of your time. Well, I played Candy Lane a million times uh, from the time that I could play it to the time that I played with little girls who are a little older than that right now. Um, I should have updated my bio. I know that was pulled off the, pulled off the church website. But uh, my two daughters now are 26 and 24. And one of them lives in Huntsville. And uh, one of them lives in Memphis and in dental school. And they are both married. Um, and uh, very, very proud of them. If you've got your Bibles, uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We'll be in John chapter 4 for uh, the, the rest of the night. This is one of those things where Andrew said, you know, just, just you know, your favorite thing to talk about. And at the time, I was engaged in, a, in a, what turned out to be a five-lesson series on John chapter 4. So I have approximately 30 hours of material um, ready for John chapter 4. Of course, we're not going to give it to you uh, all at one time. But here's a wonderful passage of Scripture, and most of us know it for one reason or another. Perhaps we know it because of Jesus' discussion about worship. Perhaps we know it because of the um, great emphasis on evangelism that uh, is in this wonderful passage of Scripture. We, of course, call this passage of Scripture the Jesus and the woman at the well. And so here is a, a passage of Scripture that's important to us for so, so many, many reasons. We have not had a shortage of water lately. I don't know if y'all have noticed that. Um, but I drove here about two and a half hours this evening in about the worst two and a half hours of, of torrential rain that I have ever driven in. And my nerves are shot. I'm telling you, the, just the sound of the rain. And it was like Mario Kart out there. Uh, I just needed some red shells to, you know, throw at the cars that were in front of me or something. There were, cars were, were bumping off the guardrails right and left and pulling down in the median. And, and I've, I probably should have stopped and helped half a dozen people, but I knew I wouldn't get here if, if I didn't. And, and uh, so... So it was, it, was, it was rough, and it's not like we needed the rain. You know, we, we've had it. Have you, y'all have had it too, right? Y'all, y'all, I think y'all have too. Uh, so, so we are uh, not 
uh, folks who generally lack water. Now, every couple of years, we'll have a couple dry, a couple months. And, and honestly, we had several weeks where, you know, the yards were looking pretty dry and we needed some water. You better be careful about asking for water, right? Because because you know what happens then. Or, or you better be careful about asking for it to stop raining because you know what happens then. You have to be careful... Uh, uh, what you ask for, because often you get exactly, exactly that. But we are a very small percentage of the world's population that has water whenever we want it. Um, I got a call from a robot um, from the Coweta County um, sewage system the other day that said that I was on a boil water notice. And I had no idea what that was. I had no idea. I had to look it up. I Googled it. What's a boil water notice? I never, never heard that in my, never heard that in my life. I looked it up. But you know why I'd never heard it? Because we are used to being able to get water whenever we want it. We turn on the little faucet or we stick our glass up into the refrigerator door and we get water. We can get it whatever temperature we want. If we want hot water, we can get water. If we want cold water, we can get it cold. And we can put ice in it, which is also made of water. And so the idea of being without water is something that we don't deal with on a regular basis. Maybe some of you have been in the mission field. I I suspect in a, in a group this size, some of you have been places where the first thing that they said to you is, don't drink the water. Don't drink the water. You can't, you know, there's, there's stuff in it that will mess you up. And uh, so you had to drink a bottle of water or you had to, you know, you had to brush your teeth with, with bottled water. We are not used to having to worry about water. But we are in a very small percentage of the world's population that does not worry about water. Back in April, um, Peachtree undertook our third or fourth campaign working with Healing Hands International uh, on a program that they have called Walk for Water. And the idea for this program is for the congregation to, to try to raise as much money as we can to um, dig wells in places where people don't have access to clean water. The average person in the world walks four miles a day to get enough water for their family to subsist, for cooking, for cleaning. And that's not to suggest that they walk four miles a day to somebody's hose and fill up a bucket and walk back. It's to suggest that they walk to what often is little more than a mud puddle, scoop what water they can out of that mud puddle into um, five-gallon buckets or what we would call gas cans and carry them back I guess two miles, if they walk two miles to it, they walk two miles back with it, but they walk four miles on average every day to get the water that they need to uh, live. We take that for granted. Up there under those various colored, uh, whatever those things are, curtains or whatever, there's a whole pool of water. And... That pool of water is for somebody who comes forward and says they want to be a Christian. We can immerse them. We can, we can completely cover them with water. We can bury them in water because we have water. I want you to imagine what it would be like to, to where, where you wanted to become a Christian. And, and, and they said, well, how are we going to baptize you? How are you going to... We don't have the water for it. And so everybody goes out and they gather water up and they get all the water they can. It's just barely enough, but it is enough to get you under that water. And it's not clean water. I mean, I've, I've been in, I, maybe, you've, maybe you've been there. Uh, and maybe you've seen somebody who was, who was baptized and uh, the baptistry heater was not working. I don't know what it is about baptistry heaters and wireless microphones, but the things just seem to never work when you need them to. But I've, I've been with people who were being baptized. Oh, it's just so cold in here. Or, oh, there's a bug. You know, we've got to get the bug. When the rest of the world is baptized in water that you can't see the bottom of because of the dirt and filth of it. I've been in the mission field in 
you know, where where um, somebody walked out into what was a cattle pasture, a pond in the middle of a cattle pasture, and there's four or five guys around the uh, the person who's being baptized, and they've all got sticks. I said, well, what are those guys doing out there with sticks? And they said, well, they're keeping the snakes off. And, and here we are failing to recognize the blessing that we have of water. Now, this passage that we're going to look at tonight is about water. It's about the living water that gives eternal life. It's about the living water that quenches the greatest thirst that we have. Let's read it. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, the passage starts off right off the get-go with water, right? They'd heard that Jesus was baptizing more disciples than John. What's baptizing? It's putting people into water. It's not pouring a little water over their head. We know that. John also tells us that, that uh, John was baptizing at Enon because there was much water there. You know why you baptize somebody where there's much water? Because it takes more than a little drop. Because it takes more than a little cup. They've got to be immersed, buried in it. So this whole passage starts off with this idea of water. And the Lord heard that the Pharisees had... And notice that it says the Lord. The Lord heard that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Now watch this. Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. And that's a parenthetical, but it's a very, very important parenthetical, right? Here's why it's an important parenthetical. You can, you can compare this passage to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where the Corinthian Christians, in all of their pride, which I think is the, the single most imperative problem at the Corinthian church, the problem was pride, and you see it reflected in the, the fight over spiritual gifts. You see it reflected in um, uh, the head covering issue. You see it reflected in the way that they had abused and, and uh, mistreated the Lord's Supper. Pride is, is that great issue there in Corinth. And, and it starts out with the issue of baptism. Well, I was baptized in the name of Paul. Well, I was baptized by Apollos. Well, I was baptized by Peter. And so here they are, and it's almost like they're, it's almost like they're, they're trading parts for the important people uh, who had influenced them and, and baptized them. And they, and they take great pride in the fact that Paul baptized them or Peter baptized them or Apollos baptized them. And, and Apollos is certainly a fascinating character, and if we had more time, we'd go into some of these different things. But can you imagine what it would be like to be able to say, Peter, what's that? Paul, who's that? Apollos, never heard of him. I was baptized by Jesus. And so what John is very careful to show us is that Jesus himself did not do any of the immersing. But that's irrelevant because what Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is that it doesn't matter if Paul baptized you. It doesn't matter if Apollos baptized you or Peter baptized you. What matters is that you were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus himself did not do any baptizing, but his disciples did. We could talk about the, the um, kind of um, jealousy or envy that the Pharisees are trying to set up between Jesus and John the Baptist, and they fail miserably at that because uh, John the Baptist has said all along that I'm not the Christ. I'm not even worthy to undo his shoes. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And they're trying to create some sort of conflict between Jesus and John, some sort of competition. There is no competition. Neither Jesus nor John will have it. John will completely deny it, and Jesus will just go somewhere else. So Jesus goes up to Galilee. Now notice what verse 4 says, and I would like for you to note this word in verse 4. But he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. Let me tell you one thing that no Jew, self-respecting Jew, ever said. I need to go through Samaria. As a matter of fact, 
They went way out of their way to not go through Samaria. They would cross the Jordan River. They'd go east across the Jordan River, up around to get to Galilee for the sole reason of not going through Samaria. They considered the Samaritans far beneath them. Samaritans weren't just Gentiles. They were worse than Gentiles. They were half-breeds. They were those folks who, who had, had compromised the faith of Israel. Those, they, they had a, a shared heritage, a shared history that we see in this story here, but they were those of Israel who had given over to idolatry, who had intermarried with the pagans of the land, and who had perverted the true worship of Jehovah God. And they were considered the vilest of the vile. So when Jesus, when Jesus wants to set out to, to tell a parable and, and show us the most radical way of relating to people who are around us, he sets it up with a Samaritan. And so there was no self-respect in Jesus, not to mention an up-and-coming rabbi who would say, I need to go through Samaria. But Jesus needed to go through Samaria because Jesus had an appointment. Because Jesus knew something that nobody else knew. He knew that there was going to be a woman who came to draw some water. And he, knew he needed to have a conversation with her. He needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, a lot of scholars believe that this particular location corresponded to the Old Testament city of Shechem. Shechem um, is a Hebrew word that uh, has a, a couple of possible meanings. One of those is uh, drunkard, and the other is faithless. So... This is not a savory neighborhood. Okay? This is not a place that had a good reputation. And certainly if you're a Jew, you would have, have uh, maintained that particular opinion. This is not a place I want to go. This is not a place I need to go. Even though there was that shared history of being a place uh, that had been visited and owned at one point by uh, Jacob or Israel and it be given to Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. You need to understand what time of day this was because it's relevant to the story. The Jewish day was, was calculated, like ours in, in a way, in 12-hour in um, intervals. The, the day was 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Now we can change our... And, and all of that sort of thing. And, and you know, I, I used to worry about time zones and stuff. I don't even know what time zone I am in now these days. You just, you, your phone just keeps up with where you are and it changes the time. You don't even have to worry about that. But back then, they didn't all have iPhones and, and uh, they didn't have to call. You remember when you, remember when you could call? The, I, don't, I don't remember where you called. You called somewhere and they would tell you, it's a, and you would set your watch by, by that exact time. Well, in this time period, the, the day was, was considered to be 12 hours long. It was 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So the first hour of the day was 6 a.m. And the third hour of the day, and this is relevant to a lot of New Testament passages, particularly when you're thinking about Jesus' trial and, and, and crucifixion and, and those sort of things, you see these, see these hours used. So the third hour of the day is 9 a.m. Okay, six, 6 to 9, the third hour of the day is 9 a.m. The sixth hour of the day is 12 noon. Okay, ninth hour of the day, 3 p.m., and then, you know, one more puts us at 6 p.m. So it says here that this was the sixth hour of the day, which makes it noon, makes it noon. Now, when I was growing up, we raised um, Brahma cattle. We'd go down to Florida and buy them and sometimes go to Texas and buy them. There weren't many of them in Tennessee at the time, so you had to go out of state. You had to go to hot states to get them because that's the only place that had Brahma cattle. They're the ones with the big humps, do lap, and the 
gear ears and all that sort of stuff. And um, so we raised these cattle. And one of my chores growing up was we had show cattle. And one of my chores growing up was to water. And sometimes the water was way away from the, from the cows. And so I would, and I remember this being six, seven, eight years old, and I'd have two five-gallon buckets. A five-gallon bucket of water weighs 40 pounds. And I remember filling those buckets up, six, seven, and eight years old, and um, I remember trying to carry those things to fill those troughs up to um, water these cattle. And the, there, there were several really, really frustrating things that would happen when you were doing that. One of those things is that uh, if you're a little boy, you're six, seven years old, and you're wearing shorts and a pair of cowboy boots, then uh, you end up with more water in your boots than you do in the bucket by the time that you get to the trough every time. Um, then when you get there and the trough is empty, and you feel what water you got up, and, and you would think, well, why would you carry two? Well, because it's a whole lot easier to carry two than one, believe it or not, because you balance yourself out. If you ever try to carry a six, seven-year-old kid uh, one, bu one bucket of water on one side, you, you, you just can't do it. So you balance it out. You know, you take little steps. You spill half of it in your boots, and you get to the, you get to the trough. Pour it in there. You know, what that, you know what that bull calf does as soon as you pour it in there? He drinks every bit of it right up. Just drinks it right up before you, before you can even get it full. He drinks it as fast as you can put it in there. So guess what you got to do? You got to go back. You got to fill it up. And I'll tell you that to tell you that getting water is hard work. Getting water is hard work. It's hard, hot work. It's hard, frustrating work. Um, whether this woman was, was carrying uh, pots, whether she had a yoke that she would put across her shoulders and carry it that way, whether she would carry it in a large pot on her head, we don't know, but that's the way people carry it around the world even today. But you know when you don't want to carry water? 12 noon. That's when you don't want to carry water. It's hot. It's hot 12 noon in, in the Middle East. It's, it's really hot. So why is she out at 12 noon, carrying water. Because let me tell you something about what um, was going on this time uh, culturally and historically. And that is that uh, every morning, and it still, it still happens, it still happens across the globe today, around the world today. Every morning, the first chore of a woman's day was generally to go draw water. Because they would need that water for their work for the day whether they had things to wash or whether they had cooking to do or whether they had bathing uh, to do, or take care of their families. They had to have water to do all of those things. And so the first thing generally that, that most women would do every morning was to get up and go draw water in the cool of the day. It's not got hot yet. And not only that, the, the rest of the family is not necessarily up yet. They get up early, go out, get their, get their pots, you know, whether they're doing this or they're this, they... They go out, and guess what? It was, a, it was a grand time for socializing. You, everybody in the village, there, you know, there's a suggestion here that this is a considerable distance from, from the village, that, that maybe it's a mile from, from the village or half a mile from the village. And so you, you would get together with your friends, and you would have this morning stroll where you'd go out and you'd ask about the kids, you'd ask about the family, you'd say, what do you got going today? Where are you going this weekend? You know, you, you, it's just a, just a time of socializing. And the whole village would go out, and sometimes the little ones would go along, and they'd be playing, they'd be running around, the women are, you know, talking to each other and having this, this good time of socializing before they started their, their hard work of the day. And that was just in the cool of the morning, and it was very common, still very common uh, practice right now. So what's this woman doing out here alone, high noon, going to fetch 40 to 80 pounds of water. Well, it's because she doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody else. It's because she's been marginalized. It's because nobody wants to have anything to do with her. It's because any time there is a crowd, then guess what they're doing? They are saying, they're pointing at her. 
And even if they're not, I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but even if they are not, which I expect they are, she feels like they are. We're going to talk about her situation in a moment, but, but I don't want you to miss this fact that she's out here drawing water at noon. And I think she has one reason for doing that. And I think the one reason that she has for drawing water at noon is because she doesn't expect to find anybody at that well and she doesn't want to find anybody at that well. But she does. She finds Jesus. A woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone in the way into the city to buy food. This is a shock to the woman. She explains why. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritan. Now you'll notice that's outside the quotation marks. The translators here felt like that she is not explaining this, but John is. And that, I guess, is up to the translators, but it's very possible that she is saying this too. But as she is shocked by this request, she does not expect Jesus to ask her for a drink. She does not expect Jesus to reach out his hand to her. She does not expect Jesus to be willing to take the vessel that she has Remember how much trouble Jesus had about how cups and plates and things were washed if they had been ritually cleansed and all of this stuff that the Pharisees worried about. And, and this, is, this is unheard of. It is, it is revolutionary for a Jew to ask a Samaritan woman who he doesn't know to give him a drink of water. It's, it's revolutionary. And, and I cannot emphasize that enough. We're going to see what Jesus accomplishes, not just with this woman, but also with the village from which she comes. As a matter of fact, I think we're going to see this woman converted. I think we're going to see this entire village become believers in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And that's important. It's significant. But I want to tell you, it starts before Jesus says, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It starts before Jesus said, you have said true, you've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. It starts before that miracle. It starts before that teaching. It starts before she runs off to town to bring everybody back. It starts when Jesus is willing to reach out his hand and touch somebody who never expected to be touched, who never expected to be asked for a drink of water. I had a friend recently who rolled down a window for her son to give money to a man who was begging on the side of the road, and the little boy reached out a dollar bill or a five dollar bill or whatever it was and gave it to the man who was begging. And then that man reached out his hand to the child, and the child took the man's hand and, and shook it. And I want you to know that I believe and expect that that touch was worth more to that man than whatever that amount of money was that was handed into him by that boy. Because there is something that happens to people who get marginalized. There is something who happens to people who are on the fringe. I was in Vietnam several years ago now, and was one of the places I've ever been where folks were the hungriest for the word that I've ever seen. We had rented a couple hotel rooms and over the course of several days, folks 
came in from provinces all around to the big city we were in, Ho Chi Minh City. And they would sit as long as you would sit with them and ask Bible questions. Questions that we take for granted. What's a deacon? What about speaking in tongues? What about food that's sacrificed to idols? Now, if I stand up here tonight and speak to you about food that's sacrificed to idols, it's a hobby horse. Although there are really some really, really important principles in that teaching. But we're not dealing with food that's sacrificed to idols. But they were. It was, a, it was a meaningful question to them. It was an important question to them. And they would sit for hours and hours, 8 to 10, 12 hours a day, just asking questions, asking questions over and over again. At one point, and, and now these folks have come in from, like I said, from provinces, and there were some folks there who were clearly sick. There were some folks there who uh, had pretty severe physical challenges, disabilities, handicaps, retardations. And at one point during one of those days, somebody gets out a thermos and one mug and they pour some ginger tea into that mug. And then they begin to pass it around. And as it goes from hand to hand around that hotel room, everybody takes it and they just refresh themselves with it. They just get some, just like we would drink coffee or ginger tea. I don't know if you've ever had ginger tea before, but it's, it's stout and it will wake you up. Um, so it's going around the room and it's coming toward me. And I'm thinking, oh, man, what in the world am I going to do? What in the world am I going to do? I don't know what these folks got. I don't know, you know, where they've come from. I, I don't know. What am I going to do when that teacup gets to me? And they would refill it from the thing as it went around. And I prayed right there, as I always do. Lord, I'm going to drink this. Uh, take care of me. And it came around, and I drank it. Passed it to the next person. I didn't get sick. I didn't die. Might have. I guess that would have been a pretty good way to go. Probably as good a way to go as any. And I did pray about it. And that wasn't the Lord's Supper. It wasn't the Lord's Supper in any, in any way. But it was communion. And I noticed that when that cup came to me, every eye in that room, every Vietnamese eye in that room was on me. What are you going to do? Are you going to share with us? Are you going to commune with us? Are you going to take with us? Or... Are you distant from us? Have you marginalized us? Are you better than us? Jesus, the Son of God, was never that. As much as He was. I love in the opening chapters of Mark when a leprous man comes to Jesus. And the leprous man runs and he falls down before Jesus. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now that passage is, is a brilliant, wonderful passage because it says, And Jesus, being moved with compassion. That, that word that's translated, being moved with compassion, is my favorite Greek word in the New Testament. The word is splank nitsomai. Okay? Some of you might be able to spell that. I probably can't. No, I probably can't. But splank nitsomai, here's, here's the word. The Greeks 
considered different levels of your organs, okay? You had your viscera, which basically from here down, your lower organs. Your middle organs, right here, were called your splanchna. Your splanchna. Several times, um, this word, splanchnitzomai, or splanchna, is translated bowels in the New Testament. In Philippians chapter 2, if there be any, your newer translations say consolation, your older translations say if there be any bowels of mercy. If you come across a King James and you wonder what it's saying there, that's the word for compassion. You, these, these organs right here. John uses it when he describes uh, compassion. Jesus was moved according to his guts. He was moved right here for this man. And Jesus being moved with compassion, listen. Listen to what it says. And Jesus being moved with compassion reached out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be clean. Now think about this for just a minute. Look, you know, you know Mark is the shortest gospel we have, 16 chapters. Mark never wastes his words. Mark says everything he can as concisely as possible. So when Mark gives you a parenthetical, then you better pay attention to it. And so here's the parenthetical. And he said, if you are willing, you can make clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said, I'm willing to be clean. We can read right over that. We can read right over the phrase, and Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. Do you know Jesus never had to touch anybody to heal them? You know that. You know that people would come to Jesus from 60 miles away and say, My son is dying. My servant is dying. He'd say, Go on back. They will. You remember when Jesus is in the synagogue on the Sabbath and the man is there with the withered hand and all the Pharisees are looking at him to see if he's going to heal them. You know, what is he going to do? And Jesus says, Reach out your hand. And he reached out his hand and his whole. What did Jesus do? Nothing. He just declared it. He could have just declared, I am willing to be clean. But he didn't. He reached out to touch a person that nobody else would touch. You know a little about leprosy. I know you do. I know you've heard sermons about it. I know that you know that it's the living death. I know that you know that, that a, a leper during this time had to go around calling out unclean, unclean wherever they went. Audience like this, I expect some of you have seen Ben-Hur. Any of you seen Ben-Hur? Good old movie, Ben-Hur. I don't know, won 15 Oscars or something greatest movies ever made. You remember when Judah's mother and sister become lepers and he wants to get them to see Jesus and when they're in the crowd and somebody realizes that they're lepers, what do they begin to do? They start pelting them with rocks because somebody that came a leper was inhuman. The finger of God. You know why it was called the finger of God? Because it was obvious that you had obviously done something terrible to deserve this punishment. You're obviously being punished. And there, and there were times when, when people in the Old Testament were punished with leprosy. Remember, Miriam is punished with leprosy. Um, Gehazi, the, the prophet's servant, is punished with leprosy. Um, is it uh, Eli's folks, his descendants are punished with leprosy? So there are many times in Scripture where leprosy was a punishment. Well, you put two and two together. If you're a leper, you've obviously done something really, really bad, and God's punishing you for it. So not only was it a physical disease that, that marginalized you and, and put you outside of any kind of society, you off from your family, shut 
you off from your friends, shut you off from the congregation of Israel. But it's a spiritual problem too. You obviously did something terrible. So when this man runs to Jesus and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And it says, and Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. That reaching out and touching him is significant. Let me give you another example. And Jesus said that here with this woman in a way. We're going to get to her. But in Acts, you don't believe me? We're going to get there eventually. We're going to get there. All right. Um, in, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John go up to the temple. Let me check my watch, by the way. All right. Got time? All right. Peter and John go up to the temple. And there's a man there who's crippled. And he's begging. He's doing it like most people do. He, you know, makes a fairly decent living doing this. He looks pitiful. There he is. He, on a, probably a rug or a blanket or something. He's got a little cup. Maybe he's saying alms for the poor. Maybe he's saying God, but whatever. You know, he knows the drill. Everybody goes by. They chuck a little, chuck a little money in there. And at the end of the day, he counts it up. He's got enough to get by on. And somebody brings him back the next day. Peter and John go up to the temple. It's about the hour of prayer. And Peter stops. And he says, look at me. See, this is a whole different deal. Because we don't like to make eye contact with people who are asking us for money, and they don't like to make eye contact with us. We don't mind putting a little money in a cup. We don't mind handing something to somebody on the side of the road, but we don't really want to engage them as a person. Human nature. Peter says, look at me. And I want to tell you, that sometimes we give dignity to people more with touch and attention than we ever will give them by putting money in their hand or in a cup. By saying, I see you. Because what happens is, is they get dehumanized. They get, they get objectified. And so Peter says, look at me. The man looks at him, says he expected to receive something from them. Here's what Peter says. Silver and gold have I none. Well, no doubt there's a little disappointment in this man's face when they say that, I would imagine. What in the world are you taking up my time for? But such as I have, I give. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he does. Now let me develop that just a second. You are not Jesus. You are not Peter and John. You can't tell a crippled person to get up and walk. You can't cleanse a leper. But you can have the same attitude that is compassionate enough to see a human being in front of you and say, I'll give you what I got. What I can do for you, I will. Not because I feel guilty, not because, you know, but because you are a human being made in the image of God. And you can preach John chapter 4 and you can go through it and I've done it Spent three Sundays in a row teaching John chapter 4 as an evangelistic model. But no evangelistic model is worth anything if we don't see in front of us a person. If we don't see in front of us an a image bearer who God loves as much as He loves anybody in this room. Every real conversion starts when Christians show people that that person matters. And you cannot tell somebody that they matter to God 
going to write this one down. I've never said it, but this is a good one. You cannot tell somebody that they matter to God if they don't matter to you. And so the conversion of this entire village begins with Jesus saying, give me a drink and being willing to take it from her hand. We've got three minutes. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Yes. Who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become to him a fountain in him, a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus, I believe here, it can be borne out and proved from, from John's gospel that he's speaking about the Holy Spirit. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not come here to draw. You see, she, she's still thinking about physical things. And sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a tough move to get somebody from physical things to spiritual things. But it always starts out with the physical things. It does. They have to know that you love them. They have to know that you care. They have to know that you see them and attend them. Give them attention. The woman said, Sir, give me this water that I may come here, not come here to draw. Go call your husband. Come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Let me tell you something about this. What have you ever thought about this woman? Just, I'll just give you just a, I mean, what's her story? Five husbands. What happened to him? My daughter is getting her uh, MFA in creative writing right now, and I said, Emma, why don't you write a story about this, this woman's five husbands? Maybe she married an older man when she was 13 or 14 years old, and he died. Maybe after that she married another one who died. You know, but, but our tendency is to think that, that she was just a, just a, a loose woman. and nobody, you know, But here, here's the deal. If, if you marry five husbands and five of them die, you know why you're not married to the sixth one? He doesn't think his odds are very good. Not to mention the fact that everything bad that happened to anybody was considered an act of God. Maybe she's barren. Maybe, maybe what she wants more than anything in the world is to have a child. And every husband that she's had have put her away because she's barren. Our tendency is to assume that there is moral failure on part of this woman. And the fact is, we don't know her story. And we are so quick to assume things about folks. I'm going to tell you that this is the last person in... If, if you wrote this, if you went to, into Sychar and said, okay, folks... Um, Let's write down the last person who is likely to find the Messiah uh, today. You know whose name they're going to write down? Her name? You know what we do so often? Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to hear about Jesus. You know, they wouldn't want to do that. We, we, don't, we look for people who have almost got it all together. That's never who Jesus looked for. It's never who Jesus looked for. It, generally speaking, it wasn't the people who came to Jesus. Sometimes it was. Nicodemus, Lazarus. Um, sometimes it was the folks who had it together, but most often it wasn't. And that was a great criticism of Jesus, that Jesus was interested in people who didn't have it together. Ah, this story goes on, and there's so much more to it. But listen, we're out of time. And if I can leave you with one thing right now, it's, it's one, be careful what you assume about people's willingness to hear about Jesus. And two, don't ever tell anybody how much God loves them if you can't show them how much you love them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your son, Jesus. We're so thankful for the living water. 
that we can have because of his promise, because of his sacrifice. We're so thankful that he reaches us in our brokenness, in our flaws, that he loves us and cares for us. Father, we beg you to forgive us of our sins and are thankful that you want to do that through his blood. We also pray that you will give us the wisdom and the compassion to see those around us who are marginalized, who have fallen through the cracks, who are broken, who are left behind, and have your heart to see in them your image and ask for a drink of water so we can bring them to the living water. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Before you leave, I've been asked to tell you one thing, not about water, but about ice cream. <laughs> At 8 o'clock when the kids are dismissed, there's ice cream in the fellowship hall, and they said there's plenty for everybody.